2020 gave us a hurricane season that was unlike any other. 30 named storms, which was a record, 14 hurricanes, seven of which were major hurricanes, tying the record from 2005. We had the ongoing pandemic, social unrest, political turmoil, and then on top of all of that, this historic hurricane season. We began 2020 with tremendous optimism. We had a great team, wonderful crowdfunding support, just this renewed sense of purpose going into the new year. I mean, hey, Greg got married, so there was that. So yeah, we got married December 28th, 2019, Elizabethtown, Kentucky. All our friends and family were there. Beautiful ceremony, awesome reception. It was a great way to end 2019. You know, with that momentum going into the new year, we thought 2020 was going to be great. We were on our way to Hawaii the next day. I was looking forward to a great, what, nine, 10 days in paradise. Unfortunately, the positivity that we had to start the new year was very short lived. We had to say goodbye to my good friend and colleague, Carrie Mallory, who I had known since about 2011. He was involved in a lot of our projects, including helping me to get my amateur radio license. He helped out on a few of the hurricane missions, most recently Hurricanes Nate and Irma back in 2017. And he was a big proponent and supporter of the Hurricane Research Balloon or the Herbie Project. Well, here it is. We found it. Carrie's the one that spotted it. Yeah. Absolutely. Unfortunately, Carrie had a stroke back in 2016, and the effects of that stroke finally caught up with him, and they were too much for him to bear, and he passed away just a few days into 2020. Well, Carrie definitely would have wanted us to continue pressing forward, keep innovating, keep that positive attitude. He certainly had a positive influence on all of us that he worked with in the time that we knew him. And you know, like they say, people may pass away, but they're never really truly gone. And that was certainly the case with Carrie. Well, I knew that Greg and Taylor were in Hawaii for their honeymoon. What a beautiful place to be. And in fact, they would be there to ring in the new year. All right, so it's January 9th. I'm in Honolulu Airport. I feel the sickest I've ever been in my entire life. And Mark texts me, and he lets me know about Carrie, which definitely was a bummer. It was a shock. I knew about it. You know, of course, I knew about a stroke, and I knew he was a little bit of poor health. And then he told me about, you know, when I get back, let's, you know, let's get talking, let's get working on things. You know, you had a great wedding and honeymoon, but now it's time to get back to work. Um, and I was like, you know, you know, sure, great. That sounds good. I didn't tell Mark at that point that I was sick. Well, once Greg got back to Mississippi from Hawaii, he and I started texting back and forth. I was talking to him about developing some of the interviews and other content for the first season of this series when he told me that he was actually quite sick and he just needed a few more days to recover. 
even though this was the sickest I've ever been, I was hoping it was like a 48 hour thing. Maybe I caught some just bug that just caught me the right way. So I didn't tell Mark about it. Um, even though he was telling me about Carrie and getting back to the States and starting to work on projects again, I felt like, you know, probably 48 hours, 72 hours, I'll feel better. Well, it's interesting because I had been hearing more and more about this coronavirus that had become a real big problem in Wuhan. And there was this fear that maybe it would become a problem also in the United States. So I mentioned this to Greg in passing in just one of my text messages. Hey, maybe you got this. You never know. And of course he was like, man, I hope not. When I got back to the Atlanta airport, I was in a daze. Like I almost felt like I had a concussion almost. Like I was not really there, but I was there. Yeah, when he told me about how sick he was, and the different symptoms that he had, I thought for sure, oh, this sounds exactly like that COVID-19 that's now becoming a big deal here in the United States. Back then, there were no antibody tests, at least not readily available like they are now, and so we didn't know for sure. All we knew is that he was terribly sick, he had no energy, and it was gonna be a little bit of time before he felt better, which of course, he eventually did, and we were finally able to get to work on this project. So now we're in the latter part of February and finally there's some winter weather that I can take advantage of. 2020 up to this point had really not produced any major winter storms, certainly not along the east coast of the United States. So when we had this system that looked like it could dump some snow in the northeast part of North Carolina, practically right in my backyard, yeah, I was very excited about covering that. I went up to Elizabeth City and Plymouth, Rocky Mount, that area over in the northeast part of the state, set out a few of these same cameras that I use to capture hurricanes and tropical storms with, just to kind of give us an idea of what the winter weather was doing. It keeps me in practice, gives me something to do in the off season. And you know, 2020 had already been kind of weird up to this point. So it was really nice to be able to get out and do something that was normal, at least up to this point. Well, it wasn't long after the North Carolina snowstorm that I finally got to cover something that I had always wanted to cover, and that was a big lake effect snow event up in New York State. The winter of 2020 had mostly been uneventful in terms of major East Coast snowstorms, and well below normal snowfall was common in the Mid-Atlantic, the Northeast, over to the Great Lakes. However, uh, as we looked ahead into the end of February, there was a significant lake effect snowstorm that took place uh, off Lake Ontario. Very similar to what we see when there's an approaching hurricane, there was a lot of chatter over several days on social media about this potentially big time lake effect snow event, mainly off of Lake Ontario, I decided to pull the trigger, load up a bunch of equipment onto an airplane, fly up there to Syracuse and cover this event in person. So you know how everyone gets excited about thunder snow and that includes me. You know, the few times I've seen it, it's been an amazing experience. You know, you've seen the famous clip with Cantori in Chicago during the blizzard. You know, they got the thunderstorm, he's going crazy. And it, understandable, it's an amazing experience. But in these lake effect events, you can get that continuously for hour after hour after hour. So some of these lake effect events can have incredible gradients. And I'm not talking like in the Northeast where we got 30 inches to five to 10 inches. I'm talking 65 inches to five inches and maybe five to 10 miles. Big time snow. Got a good lake effect band coming over. Not a breath of wind, it's absolutely calm. And so that really helps. Also helps that I'm nice and backlit so I can show the, uh, the snow. It's coming down, you know, nice and steady. Probably got two inches inside of an hour. 
When it comes to predicting these lake effect snow events, one critical piece of that forecasting puzzle is the winds in the lower atmosphere. So for this event, we had strong west southwesterly winds and that blew across the whole long axis of Lake Ontario and that maximizes the available moisture. And that type of airflow allowed the intense bands of snow to develop and persist over the elevated Tug Hill Plateau. So providing this extra orographic lift that's the area between Syracuse and Watertown in the northern part of New York, rather than Rochester and Buffalo. It was really special to me to be able to document something using the same cameras that I use in hurricanes in the lee of Lake Ontario in upstate New York to capture the effects of a fairly intense lake effect snow event. It definitely lived up to its reputation. I was very glad I went. It turns out it was the last normal thing that I would get to do in 2020. I returned from New York on February 29th, and within a week of me being back, everything changed. I mean, we all remember it. By mid-March, COVID-19 was spreading across the country. Stuff was getting shut down. Events were getting canceled. It was like a giant hurricane was coming that nobody knew anything about or how to prepare for. During a hurricane, you've got supplies, you've got mutual aid, you've got people, you've got places, you've got things that are coming in. We were not ready for that potential battle because we didn't have the supplies and we're not used to that. We were all scrambling to try to figure out our new lives, this alternate reality that everybody had been thrown into with virtually no warning. And at the same time that the pandemic is growing in scope, in size and in severity, we are now less than 90 days away from the beginning of a potentially historic hurricane season. The signs emerged really as early as March that we might be headed for a very active season. The factors behind that, well, we had La Nina, which was building in the Pacific Ocean. Couple that with a warmer than average Atlantic Ocean at present and also predicted in the future as we approach the peak of the hurricane season. Those two things together, typically a hallmark for active Atlantic hurricane seasons. Well, now we get towards the end of March and into early April and the Outer Banks are sealed off from the outside world. Nobody's allowed in there if they don't live there. The Florida Keys basically does the same thing. This big hurricane season is supposedly on the way, and I'm worried that I'm not even gonna be able to leave North Carolina. I'm talking to Greg on the phone at night trying to figure things out. What are we gonna do? What is Brent gonna do? Is he gonna be able to come up from the Virgin Islands? So it's already challenging traveling from St. John to the States, trying to figure out where I'm gonna meet Mark. I mean, I gotta bring all my gear, pack it up. I gotta go take a boat ferry, car, everything, and now slap on the COVID on top of that, I mean, that's going to be a hard run. And there was a point there where they had patrols on the Alabama-Florida border, not allowing people to do interstate travel. So we were thinking to ourselves there, especially as we were moving into late March and early April, are we even going to be allowed to go into these storms? The other issue that we might have to face during the upcoming hurricane season was that of evacuation. How do you social distance during a pandemic and yet expect people to go to a public shelter in the face of a potential major hurricane heading their way? Is the risk for folks to go to the shelter or are they better off staying at home to shelter in place due to the COVID concern? Then what if I had a worst case storm surge scenario, if I had 20 or 30,000 people to move was I really gonna move 30,000 people? And I had pretty much made up my mind that no, I was going to go to a targeted evacuation, shelter in place or get residents, ask residents to shelter in place to the fullest extent possible and know that I may have to deliver services and goods where in fact folks are sheltering in place and we may have to make a home delivery. 
When we saw the guidance come out for April, it more or less sealed the deal. The UK Met, ECMWF, once again, predicting a potential for a hyperactive season. And when it came to forecasting, in this case, consistency is key. We saw that develop, the signal develop early in the year, and it persisted as we went from March to April to May, right on into the Atlantic hurricane season. We saw the signal for a very active uh, peak season as we worked our way to August and September. I was very fortunate during the lockdown period here in the United States to communicate back and forth with Ben Knoll down in New Zealand. He would even join me live on my YouTube channel all the way from New Zealand to discuss the upcoming hurricane season and what we would be looking for. But it was so weird because in the background, the pandemic was always there. And to make it even more bizarre, there's been also tweeting about COVID tracking maps. It was just so weird globally. And for us as a crew, my family and myself, we didn't know what was gonna happen when all was said and done. Traveling for the hurricane season, am I gonna be able to come back and forth from St. John? Do I gotta get a COVID test every time I fly back in? Man, there's a lot of unknowns and it's gonna be a difficult one. It's mid-May and no one knew what was gonna happen with this whole COVID thing. It had become politicized, people were picking sides. There were rallies to demand the reopening of the economy. I mean, it was all consuming and enough to just drive everybody mad. So as a family, we decided that we would just get away from it all, head out to the Western part of North Carolina and just enjoy the great outdoors together. And of course, with it being 2020, we get another preseason storm. Where's it headed? North Carolina Outer Banks. And just like that, it's time for me to get to work. Well, here we are. 2020 hurricane season getting started early. We've got tropical storm Arthur. We're gonna impact the North Carolina Outer Banks. That's where I'm heading now. Bringing three camera systems with me, not expecting a major impact out of this, but you never know. Well, it figures that the first named storm of 2020, the first of 30 named storms, mind you, is gonna impact practically in my backyard. At least though, it was familiar territory, but you have to remember, the Outer Banks just reopened. Dare County just opened up on Saturday, May 16th. And when is the first advisory for Arthur? Saturday, May 16th. It was very surreal to be back out there and it certainly fit in with 2020's agenda. Western North Carolina on Saturday the 16th right after the first advisory was issued for Arthur. Went home to Wilmington, gathered up some equipment and took off to the Outer Banks on Sunday the 17th. I was out there for a couple of days, set up a couple of cameras there from Nags Head, Kitty Hawk area down to Rodanthe. Arthur was not a real big problem. I think it was more of a symbol of what was going to be coming on the road ahead for this very busy and historic 2020 hurricane season. <laughs> 